How many of you know that living by faith is the crux of our Christian faith? Living by faith is the crux of our Christian experience. Everything we are, do, and believe comes from that place of faith. And I was, uh, felt like God drew my attention this week to the book of Habakkuk. And uh, we'll be there this morning. We're going to do all 49 chapters. There's only three. But it's quite a book when you understand this whole idea that the just shall live by faith really could be called the central truth of evangelicalism. It's what links us from other Christian faiths is that we believe that our Christian life is a faith experience and probably all of us are familiar with what Paul writes to the church in Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Every evangelical owes a debt of gratitude to a man named Martin Luther. It launched what is called the Protestant Reformation. And I did a little research into Luther this week, just kind of interested, and I thought I'd pass a little bit along to you because I'd always had him pictured as a monk who had this revelation from God and deeply spiritual, and in a moment of rebellion, nailed his thesis to the door of the church in Wittenberg. And as I dug a little bit more, I found a different kind of character that I think would give us some background for this revelation of the just shall live by faith. While he was at the monastery in Wittenberg, Luther would confess daily his sins, sometimes hours at a time, because that's how faith then in that structure was built. You have to confess your sins all of the time. Historians say that the confessor grew weary with his coming and finally told him, to please commit a sin worth confessing. <laughs> his problem was that he couldn't remember, he said, all of his sins. And that's the problem with the works-based salvation. He understood righteousness of God as an active, punishing righteousness which demanded that mankind keep the whole law of God. But in his reading of Romans and Habakkuk, he began to understand that righteousness in Romans was called of God and came from God. This way of righteousness, as he describes it, was demonstrated through Christ's work on the cross. If a sinner places faith in Jesus Christ, he's justified. He appears before God just as if he never sinned. Luther understood that the just shall live by faith means not by their own works of righteousness, but that this faith brings one to Christ who is perfectly righteous and justifies the sinner. And you say, well, yeah, I know that, but in that time that was revolutionary. That was radical. It required a divine revelation. So you might also note when we talk about the past, Luther in another place who wrote this song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, said this about music. The devil doesn't stay where there's music. Now, I would edit that. The devil doesn't stay where there's good music <laughs> or godly music. Music is the greatest gift. Indeed, it is divine. It puts to flight all sad thoughts. So even in that, you can hear his struggle, his journey for a place where there'd be freedom from this load of guilt that was on his back. So when he protested, when he had this revelation and was protesting the indulgences, he wrote his 95 theses and nailed them to the church door at Wittenberg. Now that wasn't a radical uh, act on his part. That's where the idea of a blog came from. <laughs> that if you wanted to post your thoughts and get people to respond. It was like a religious bulletin board, and so it was okay to do that. And he did that, but it inflamed the Pope with what he had to say. And the Pope ordered a papal bull to be written against Luther, condemning him. And when Luther received his copy, he publicly burned it. 
I'm liking him more all the time. <laughs> then he appealed to the emperor for protection. <laughs> so one of the political leaders of the time had him kidnapped, and Luther was going through some other struggles as well. Luther said, believed, that it was better for a priest to marry than to stay single. Now listen to what he says. This is hilarious. At least I thought it was. You might not at all. So I'm just warning you. This is hilarious. Leaving a housekeeper and a man alone, which would have happened, the priest there and then having a housekeeper, leaving a housekeeper and a man alone is like bring, bringing fire and straw together and trying to forbid the blaze or the smoke. Isn't that great? So at age 42, he married Catherine, who was 24, a former nun who was smuggled out of a nunnery in an empty pickled herring barrel. I mean, this was just great stuff, that how God was working and shaping him for this moment. Martin and Catherine would have six children together. One of the historians described Luther this way. He was a wild, flowing, rushing torrent. So he wasn't this staid, meditative monk. There was a fire burning on the inside of him that wanted answers and wanted direction and wanted to know what the right thing was to do. A German theologian described Luther this way. Some have complained that Luther was too severe. I will not deny this, but I will answer in the language of Erasmus. Because the sickness was so great, God gave this age a rough doctor. If Luther was severe, it's because of his earnestness for the truth, not because he loved strife or harshness. Out of his ministry, his life experience came this great revelation of faith and faith alone as the way of salvation. And the, ori the original truth we read about isn't found in Romans. It's found in Habakkuk, where it says the just shall live by his faith. And we need to understand the context of that. As I was digging into those verses, when I say the just shall live by faith, we tend to incorporate it this way. When we want a miracle, we need to live by faith. When we want prosperity, we need to live by faith. When we want something from God, we need to live by faith, speak it by faith, and express it and believe God for it. But this context for the just shall live by his faith has absolutely nothing to do with you receiving a blessing. It has to do with how to live when life is confusing or unfair. How many of you have ever looked around at your life or the world we live in and thought, what in the world is God doing? Why doesn't God do something here? Why doesn't God bring revival to America? Why is my family in this condition? Why are my circumstances like this? God, where are you? What are you doing? I'm so tempted to digress. Yeah, no, I won't say that. I'm, I'm controlling myself here. This is called self-discipline right now. Why do we have the leadership we have? <laughs> why, why, why? We pray for God to bring revival to America. I've prayed that. And we quote the verse, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. What is the prophet telling us? That a broken nation has a direct relationship to what's happening among the people of God. And if we want God to heal our nation, the time has come that judgment begin at the house of God. So what if, I'm not suggesting this is going to happen, please, I'm not gloom and doom, I don't want this to happen, but what if in order to bring revival to America, there was an attack on our land that would make 9-11 look pale and brought us to our knees 
where we had no resource and destroyed all of our creature comforts under an Islamic regime. Do you still want revival? Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes, sometimes we need to be careful what we ask God for. Because the answer may not be what we were hoping for. Is anybody hearing me right now? Praying for God to do work in your family, for God to do work on your job, for God to release power in some situation you're facing. Do we really want him to do that? And that's the situation that Habakkuk is facing. God is going to bring Israel to repentance. How? By releasing the Babylonian armies against them and bringing them into captivity. And he's asking God, why? Why is this going to happen? And one commentator said it this way that I thought was so powerful. An explanation for Habakkuk as to why God was using the Babylonians to punish Judah might have been interesting, but how would it have helped the Judites when Babylonian hordes were overrunning Jerusalem, killing their defenders and setting fire to their homes? The response God did give was not to not to satisfy Habakkuk's curiosity, but rather to teach them that faithfulness will enable them to get through the troubles that they could not avoid. That was a far greater use than an explanation as to why God was doing what he was doing. To teach us and equip us and strengthen us for the challenge is more important than understanding why God's moving the way he is. Is that making any sense at all? In effect, God was telling Habakkuk that during the period when the wicked Babylonians would be in control and God's promise to restore Judah was not yet fulfilled, Habakkuk was to trust God's assurance and rely on God's strength to persevere. The command then was shorthanded, the righteous will live by being faithful. That's the main point of the thrust of the entire book. How are we going to survive in an increasing chaotic and hostile world? It's not about how to see a miracle. It's about how to survive. And in times when we don't understand, when the world doesn't make sense, when we can't figure out what's going on, it's in those moments that we need to say, the righteous, the just, the just will live by his faith. That's your bottom line. Help me this morning. That's your bottom line. Not... Can I figure it out? Not, will God give me an answer? Not, will God explain to me what he's doing? But in those times, learning that living by faith means trusting him when I don't understand. Trusting him then. And the book of Habakkuk takes us on a journey to that end that I want us to explore this morning and get a better grip on the just shall live by his faith. We talked in the series about the de-church, all the arguments that there are. And I get that. I don't want anyone to check their brain at the door. And I do think this needs to be a safe place where we talk about our questions and concerns and our confusion. But make no mistake about it. The bottom line isn't about finding answers. The bottom line is about how learning to live by faith in a real God, in a real world that keeps you in a real relationship with Jesus. That's the core. Are you living by faith or are you living by, by trying to find answers to your life journey? Well, it begins in chapter 1 with this statement from this concept from Habakkuk. I will wonder. He says in the beginning, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. God, how long will you put up with this? God, how long do I have to stay in this trial? God, how long do I have to suffer? God, how long before my circumstances change? Is anyone hearing me this morning? How long, oh God, how long? It's the wrong question. 
he begins with raising his concerns. And I do want to emphasize that God is never intimidated by your questions. He doesn't say, Gabriel, did you hear what they just asked? I think we need to torch that one. <laughs> I've always wanted one of those salt guns that they shoot at flies, you know? I don't know if they work. I just think they'd be cool. But I'm afraid God might have one. <laughs> He's not intimidated. You don't have to worry you're going to offend him. He's big enough to carry your questions. And it begins in an honest pursuit by saying, God, I don't get this. It's not that you have to look at the confusion and say, I like it. It doesn't mean you have to look at the pain and say, I'm enjoying this. If that's where you are, get some therapy. That's not where you need to live. It's not wrong to have questions. But hear me clearly this morning. What you do with your questions will dictate your destiny. What you do with your questions will dictate your destiny. Now, I want to show you something that I've heard quoted over the years, totally out of context. It's been quoted in the context of, of, of revival, that God does great things. And maybe you've heard this in verse 5. God says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if it were told you. Doesn't that sound great? Is anybody here this morning? That, doesn't that sound great? God, if I were to say to you this morning, listen, I'm telling you what, God's brought a revelation that he's going to do something that you would not ever imagine. You wouldn't believe it were true if it were told you. God's going to do something beyond our understanding. And we'd say, oh, he's going to rain gold dust. He's going to make us rich. That is not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going to bring an answer that is so profound that it will not make sense to you. In order to bring the nation to repentance, because the salvation of the lost is more important than the comfort of the believers, I'm going to release the Babylonians on Israel, on Judah. I'm going to release the Babylonians on Judah because they have rebelled against me and have walked away from me. And it's going to be so bizarre in your mind that you will not be able to get your brain around it. God is going to do something that will judge evil and purify his people. And our problem is we see the moment and we miss the big picture. We see a little slice and we, we don't know the big thing God is doing. It's not about your momentary trial. It's about God's bigger picture of ultimate glory and purifying of his people. So, God, how can you do this? I mean, that's a fair question. God, how? Can you use, this is a big issue for Habakkuk, how can you use people who are more wicked than Judah to judge Judah? Have you ever felt like God wasn't paying attention to your logic? God, you can't do this. Whenever, now I believe that God can be trusted. I believe he's reliable, he's consistent, and he can be found in the book. But when you're in a place to tell God that he's not doing it right? You're not in a good place. You're not in a good place. It'd be like a kindergartner telling you that you're fixing supper wrong or you're repairing something wrong. God is not looking for us to correct him. And Habakkuk is saying, God, I can't get my brain around this. They're worse than Judah. How can you use, Ju how can you use Babylon to judge Judah when Babylon is so wicked, so evil? Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. My rock have... You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. 
but your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You can't tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate their treacherousness? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than them? Do you see what's happening right there? He's measuring one against the other as the one is more righteous than the other when we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Well, I'm better. Now, don't, uh, don't acknowledge that you have any idea what I'm talking about right now. But I'm more righteous than they are. Why are they more blessed than I am? God, I'm living right there not. That's the question he's asking. How is this fair? God, you can't do this. You can't bless evil. <laughs> I'm just telling you. God can do whatever he wants. He'll never violate his word but he's not obligated to our opinions. Are you with me? Trying to, trying to help. This already worked me over. I've already repented. Now it's your turn. So this is life-saving for you, okay? This is life-saving. Ready? You need to write this down and put it on your bathroom mirror or your refrigerator, whichever one you go to first or more frequently. <laughs> You ready? This is great. You ready? Don't expect that God's ways will always make sense to you. But trust that they will always make sense to God. Don't expect that God's ways will always make sense to you, but trust that they will always make sense to God. I, I was I shared a little bit of this with my wife. It just happened and don't have a lot, of, we haven't had a lot of time to talk, but a young man that was in school with our son Josh um, texted me or Facebooked me this week and doing a study on death and dying and how unfair it was that, that Josh died when he did and how influenced him. He's been in ministry for 20 years. And I'm just gonna tell you from our experience, it's not about whether it makes sense to me it's about trusting that it made sense to God. Are you with me this morning? Somebody needs to hear that. It's not about your evaluation. It's about his purpose. It's okay to wonder. We all will. It's human. It's honest. But what do you do next? Chapter 2 he says, I will watch. And I would encourage you, in those times when you wonder about what God is doing, in those times when you're confused about what's happening, that's not the time to get out of the boat. That's not the time to cast inflection at God. It is time to, forgive me, shut up and watch. Just watch. Watch. Watch what God is doing. Watch what is going to happen. Habakkuk says in chapter 2, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. God will not leave you in question. God will not leave you alone, will not leave you in ignorance. But in reality, he's saying, I'm going to watch and wait till I hear from God. What would happen to us if we practiced that? We decided, I don't understand it, so I'm gonna watch and I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna watch and see, because I know he'll give me an answer. I'm gonna watch and see what he will say to me. There's a time for us to be still and watch and wait and know that he is God. So he begins to give this exclamation, ex explanation that you have to see that not only is Judah in sin, but the enemy is puffed up. And in this moment, both will be brought to their knees. I thought it'd be helpful this morning if we just looked at a description of the, of the enemy, uh, I mean of the um, wicked. See the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. So he's saying it's not about who's more righteous, it's about who's living by faith in God. The measuring rod is where is your faith? He'll live by his faithfulness. 
Because of the enemy, the wicked, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. He's as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives all people. He's talking about someone that's being destroyed by their appetites, not holding anything back, are puffed up in arrogance. And those people are going to be brought down, brought down as well. You'll see evil in the nation of Judah, but you'll see evil on a broader panoramic perspective. We really do tend to measure sin in degrees. We really do. (laughs) We're not as bad as they are. And God sees the defilement that all sin brings. Do you see the difference? It's not about who's doing more or less. It's about what is sin doing in you and are you living in tune in relationship with Jesus Christ, that being cleansed and worked out of you. So many things happen that can derail you and frustrate you, but rather than responding that way and saying, well, I'm, they're worse than I am, that's not the question. Where are you in standing with him? Because here is what God's gonna do. Verse 14, here's the heart and nature of God. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And he says, woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, putting it from the wineskin or pouring it from the wineskin till they're drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame. And he's talking about what they're doing. So when we sing that song, that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, you have to understand that, that the channel to get there is a humbling and a breaking that brings us to that place. Do we want that? Look around you. Look what's happening around you. Look at the tragedy that's happening around you and what part even the church is playing in that tragedy. Because there's one thing that I'm sure of. God will be glorified. And the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I know that to be true. I also know that there's going to be a catching away of the church. I also know that there's going to be a time called the beginning of sorrows. I also know that there's a time called the great tribulation. I also know that there's a battle of Armageddon. I also know that there's a thousand year reign of Christ. And at the end of that, there's another great battle of light against darkness before the heavens and earth pass away and a new heaven and new earth that replaces that. And we go on forever. The day will come, but the day will not come without trial and testing. The the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Maybe you should read it in its context before you sing it as your song. Hello? Well, I enjoyed this study a lot more last week. (laughs) Woe to those who try to hinder that from happening, that replace being a drunk on spirits rather than walking in the spirit. God has an eternal plan to redeem this fallen world and he will bring glory out of the depravity that is around us. And that's the lens you have to look through that God is not. We've discovered that in that kingdom now move. We are not going to make the world better and better and better until Jesus slides into his throne. I got caught up that and a little bit in the political world some years ago. We're just going to get it better and better and better and then Jesus is going to come back. No, when we have broken ourselves beyond repair, he'll return for a people who are living by faith, walking by faith, because the goal is is that men and women, boys and girls, come to faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever they've done, wherever they've been, that they will come to a place of faith in Jesus Christ. So he says, after that panoramic view, I will wonder and I will watch and wait. And here's what will happen. 
if you bring your wondering to God and you watch and wait, you know where you'll come? You'll come to the place that says, I will worship. When I don't understand, when I don't feel like it, when it doesn't make sense, I will worship. Because there is strength in that experience. He says, beginning in chapter 3, after all that he's seen, Lord, I've heard your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. And he's changed his whole perspective. He's wondered. He's watched. He's waited. He's seen God's big plan. And he says, God, I'm with it. I understand it. I'm, I'm amazed at your greatness and grandeur. I just ask that in your wrath, in your judgment, please also be merciful, which is the heart and nature of God. He takes no pleasure in the death of the righteous, of the wicked. No pleasure. Do you know it's really helpful sometimes to remind yourself of the great things God has done in your life? Particularly in those moments when you're frustrated. If I went around the room this morning, how many of you could give me a testimony of a time that God intervened and did something powerful in your life? Let me see your hands. You could, do you know it's really good to rehearse that? And when should you rehearse it? When it's not making sense. When the bottom falls out. When life is hard. Rather than questioning what he's doing. Are you ready for this? Rather than questioning what he's doing, start rehearsing what he's done. And when you don't understand what he's doing, but you begin to rehearse what he's done, you'll come to a place that God is awesome. God is great. God is majestic. God is powerful. And I can trust his future, um, his future doings based on his previous manifestations. He says, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. I thought, what is that all about? What does that even mean? And, and what you discover is that it is a poetic expression of the Mount of Olives. I mean, the Mount of Mount Sinai and the deliverance of God's people there. He's going back to remember how they got where they were. They didn't get where they were by the hand of God in their brokenness. But he's saying, I remember that God showed himself strong at Sinai. I remember God's hand through the wilderness that their clothes didn't wear out and God provided supernaturally. I remember all that he's done. I remember where I started. I remember where we came from. And God didn't bring us this far to leave us. God didn't bring us this far to let us down. God didn't bring us here so that we would simply collapse and be left alone. That God is an awesome, wonderful, glorious God that we can trust and serve. He has delivered and he will deliver again. So then, Here's what it means for the just to live by faith. All that was introduction. Here's the crux. Here's the core. I don't like this verse. Verse 16. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I wait patiently for the day of calamity. I know it's going to come. I know the judgment he's going to have to bring. And he said, I trembled when I saw it, but I've learned to wait patiently. Here's the crux. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the oil crop fails, and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in my Lord. And I will be joyful in the God, in my God, my Savior. Now let me pause on that for a moment. There are a lot of places where if I said that without quoting it, would rebuke for my speaking death into people's lives. 
that we should only speak the positive, we should only speak the victory, we should only speak the joy. And I do believe that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And I do believe what you say matters. I certainly believe all of that. But the bottom line of living by faith is what Habakkuk discovers at the end of his journey. I will wonder, but I will wait and watch, and now I will worship. And he comes to this, this purity of faith. My faith isn't based on prosperity. My faith is based on the provision of the Savior. And let me read this again. So when my fig tree does not bud, when my vines produce no grapes, when my olive crop fails, when the fields are barren from drought, no food, no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, the just shall live by his faith. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. My faith is not dependent on getting what I ask for. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to discouraged people who say, I prayed and I asked God and he didn't do what I asked for. God doesn't answer prayer. Do you see how arrogant that is? That our faith rests on God doing what we want. That our faith rests on God obeying what we declare. That our faith rests on God producing something that will bless us. But the purity of faith is, my faith is in God, irrespective of my circumstance, I will trust him. That's a deeper place of faith. I don't expect a new convert to get there. I don't expect someone new in their journey to understand that. But some of us have been around the block a couple times. Come on, is there anyone in the house? I've been in the place where the fields were barren, where there's no fruit on the vine. And I've learned in those moments, whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content that God can be trusted. He was awesome in the past. He will be awesome in the future. And I'm going to trust him today when my world doesn't make sense. I'm going to trust him today. Can you imagine a child saying, I don't believe my parents love me because they didn't give me what I asked for? Yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> but can you imagine them saying, I don't have parents. My parents don't exist because they didn't give me what I wanted. That'd be silly, wouldn't it? Even if you have terrible parents, they're alive. We joke about something that happened with my sister when her daughter was really little. They were at a department store, a, a, a discount store, and as they're going through the checkout, you know how they have those little things there right by the checkout to capture those of you who are impulsive buyers <laughs> that cannot walk by that salted nut roll? For me, it's take five. It's, Carol's got to pull me away. I can grab one of those. You don't need one of those today. Oh, but I do. I do. <laughs> so my sister looked at her daughter, and she'd been good, and they had those little cheap, es ec those etch-a-sketches, you know, they're about this big. And so she pulled one off and gave it to her. The cashier is standing there. My niece is standing there. My, my sister is standing there, gives it to her, and going to buy it. And she said, Mom. Why are you being so nice to me today? <laughs> and the cashier's looking at them like, I wonder what's going on in that household. <laughs> you see, my parents are my parents when they do what I want. They're also my parents when they restrict what I want. Hello? And sometimes you have to live through not having to appreciate having one of the great moments around um, trick-or-treat tr around the lake that we experienced was being able to bless kids with candy. And one little girl walks up. It was after things had stopped and nothing in her, in her bucket. And the place had closed. She got there late. Everything was closed up. And um, they explained what had happened. And I said, oh, come over here, sweetheart. We've got candy for you. And we had a big, we had a big bucket. 
we had a bin and we had more bins. In fact, we had a bag of little Tootsie Rolls I just wanted to give away because that's not the good stuff. <laughs> so I filled her bucket all the way up, about this far from the top. And her response, don't judge her, listen to me for a moment. Her response was, can I have some more? Because she was coming from a background where she didn't have. Come on. And she and she didn't know when she was going to have again. So she had to get all she could at that moment. And I thought, I know Christians like that. It's out of our poverty that we don't trust his provision. My bucket is empty. God, I need you to fill it and fill it with a little more. But I'm convinced it's not till our bucket is empty that we really learn how to trust him as our source and provision. He'll be there tomorrow. He'll be there the next day. In those down times, can you worship then? Or will you just sit around and complain about your life? We need to learn to live by faith and what it really means. There's an old story about a farmer who was asked to lead prayer in church. And when he would lead prayer in church out loud, he would always end this way. And, oh Lord, prop us up on our leaning side. The pastor heard that several times and finally said, what in the world do you mean by prop us up on our leaning side. The farmer said, well, I've got an old barn and it's been there a long time. It's been through a lot of storms. The bugs have eaten it. And I got to looking at it one day and I noticed that it was starting to lean to one side. So I thought to myself, this can't be good. It's only a matter of time before it falls. So I went and I got some pine beams and I propped it up. It still leans and it probably always will, but it will not fall down because I supported it on its leaning side. I got to thinking, he went on to say, I've thought about the kind of year I've had, the storms I've been through, some of the people who are bugging me and eating away my joy. And I got to thinking, I'm still here I'm still standing after all I've been through. The howling winds, they can't topple me. It's because God's grace has propped me up on my leaning side. That's the God we serve. Are you leaning today? He's got beams that will prop you up on your leaning side. It's all right to wonder as long as you learn to watch and wait and you'll come to the place that you can worship even when the barn's empty. That's what it means. The just shall live by faith. It's not about celebrating when there's victory as we should and we all want that. It's about learning how to continue to worship when you're between the days of blessing. What do you do in the valley? He wants to prop you up on the leaning side. Let's stand together and lean a little bit and let Jesus prop us up.